Hey everybody, it's Pastor Randy with Impact Community Church, and I want to take this time to invite you to our Easter service this year. We'll be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is no Sunday like Easter Sunday. It'll be a great day for the entire family. The Lord has given me a special message this year, NIL. And through the resurrection of Jesus, He has given us permission to use His NIL his name, his image, and his likeness. What a blessing that is. Service starts at 10.30 a.m. Please come early, grab a cup of coffee and a donut. You can even take a family portrait at our photo booth before service. So don't forget, Easter Sunday this year is March 31st, which is the last Sunday in March. We look forward to seeing you Easter Sunday. sermon series with one simple question, why is love hard? We talked about godly love, and we talked about relational love. Last week we talked about relationship love, and we spent a lot of time talking about marriage. This morning I want to talk about the love that we have one for another, especially how we treat our enemies. One of the litmus tests of your Christianity is not how you treat people who like you. It's how you treat people that really don't like you. I just want you to open up your heart this morning because we're going to say some things in an effort, in some cases, to instruct you and educate you. But then I also want you just to understand that if you are a Christian, you should be loving people. Amen. I heard just a couple of weak amens, but I'm going to say it again, that if you are a Christian, you should be loving people. You're like, well, my mama made me mad. You should be loving your mama. My daddy made me mad. You should be loving your daddy. Last week, we found out your spouse can make you mad, but you still, still should be loving your spouse. Amen. And you should be loving your enemies. Sometimes, in all honesty, you have to love them from a distance, but you still should be loving your enemies. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 43, it says, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. I think if, if God had put that in our heart, I don't know if we would have still wrote it down. He may have put it in our heart, but I don't know if we would have said like, I, I, I think this is too much for some of us to do. To love them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I don't know where we have come up with the notion that being a Christian is going to be easy and that everything is going to go your way all the time and that you'll never have any enemies, you'll never have any foes, you'll never have anybody who comes against you. I'm just here to tell you as a pastor that every day won't be the best day, but you can still get through every day with Christ. Your goal in life is to love everybody every day. Amen. 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 
While we're standing, I just want to have a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you for being in your house this morning. We thank you for the word that will go forth today, God. It will touch the hearts and minds of those who are here today, causing increase in their lives today, God. We thank you for this four-part series today, God, about loving today. And God, we ask that as we conclude this series today, you would help us to love even our enemies and the people that we know don't mean us any good, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for changing our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was talking to his people in the Beatitudes, and one of the things that he told them, even before he got into his ministry, he told them what love was going to be like. And he says, you have heard that it had been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, and this is the way of the world. And I want you to understand that Jesus is taking us, he's transitioning us from the world to what the Bible says. The Bible says, verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Say love. love. Say love. love. Say enemies. enemies. How many know that before this life is over, you're going to have some enemies? Yeah. Amen. Amen. In fact, according to the Bible, you already have one. He was here when you got here. He doesn't like you. He's the accuser of the brethren. And so anything that you do that you think is going to glorify God, he's going to be in your way every step of the way. And so we have an enemy. Enemy comes from the Greek word ekthros, which means hostile, hated, an enemy, someone openly hostile or deep-seated hatred. It implies irrevocable hostility. I wanted to use that definition because sometimes people think like my enemy is someone that I just made mad today. Or someone who just didn't like me today. No, an enemy is someone who has a deep-seated hatred towards you. It's not someone that you met today and you got mad today, someone that cut you off today. No, those aren't your enemies. Your enemies aren't your husband. It's not your wife. It's someone that for whatever reason, they have a deep-seated hatred. And so let me give you just a little bit of biblical knowledge this morning. So when Jesus was talking to his people, he told them that you have to love your enemies. And so at that time, the Jews were under Roman control. And so everything that occurred in Israel at that time happened because the Roman government allowed it to happen. When we see Herod, when we see Festus, when we see Felix, when we see uh, Caesar, everybody was under the control of Caesar. So the Jews had their own lifestyle, but everything was subjugated to what the Romans allowed. Remember, these were God's people. He gave them promises. He gave them land. He told them that they were going to be blessed. And now everything they did didn't come necessarily from God, but it came from the Roman rulership. Are you making sense? And so they were saying, at what point in time are we going to come out from underneath this Roman rulership? In fact, when Jesus came, remember, there were, there were many who thought he was going to take over the Roman government. They thought that he was going to make them free in a way that they thought we hadn't been free before. So when Jesus is telling them to love your enemies, he's telling them to love the people who in some cases were extorting from you. The reason people didn't like Matthew is because Matthew was a tax collector who was put in place by the Roman government. And so not only did he extract taxes from people, he extracted a little bit more for his own sake. Does this make sense? I want you to understand who your real enemy is. Do you know racism is not a person? I just thought, I, I just, I'm just letting this absorb, I'm letting your spirit absorb this because sometimes we take out our, our frustrations and our anger on people and we call that person our enemy and sometimes it's deeper than that. Amen. Amen. And God says, I want you to love people who persecute you, love people who abuse you, 
Love people who backbite and talk about you. I want you to love people because that is the litmus test of Christianity. Not how much you give, not how much you pray, not how much you fast, not how often you come to church. I don't care if you go to Sunday school and I went to BYPU, I went to what all of the BYPUs are, and I, I made it to Sunday morning service. If you can't love, I'm going to question your Christianity. Is this making sense? So when Jesus said, love your enemies, he's telling them to love your oppressors. Uh-oh. He's saying, love the people who every day, if, if a Roman soldier wanted to come and ask you to do anything, they could ask you to do it, and you would have to do it. See, we read a scripture, and sometimes we don't know what it means, but when Jesus said, if they ask for your coat, then give them your cloak also, because they could say, we need this in the name of the government, and they could take it, because the government today says they need things in the name of the government, and some of us get mad. Y'all don't want to talk to me. I better move on. And so the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 46, it says, for if you love them which love you, what reward do you have? Do even the publicans or people without Christ do the same? Verse 47 of Matthew chapter 5 says, And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans do it. And then he says, Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Our goal is to strive for perfection in love. That's our goal, that every day we strive to be a better person of love. Is this making sense? I got three points before we go into our other points. And so say loving is necessary. As a Christian, love is necessary. It's something that you can't get out of. You're like, well... I can get out of this, I can get out of that. I, I, I don't want to tithe the way I want to tithe. No, but here's the deal with regard to love. Loving is necessary. Loving shows that God is our Father, and we are His children, and we desire to be like God. Because when God said, love your enemies, He's not telling you to do anything that He hasn't done. Because the Bible says that we were far away from God. We were enemies to God, but He loved us anyway. Amen. So he gave his son as a ransom. The scripture says the propitiation of our sins, whether we accepted Jesus Christ or not. We were the enemies and he still loved us. So when you come across someone today or tomorrow or next week and you view them as an enemy, you can't treat them like an enemy. Isn't it something? This is the Christian way that you can know somebody as an enemy, but God says we don't treat them as an enemy. We treat them with love. So love is necessary. Love shows that God is our Father and we are His children and we desire to be like Him. Love shows we are maturing in our faith. The Bible says if you only treat people who are nice to you with love, then He says you still missed it. Because even the publicans do that. As a Christian, there's another level that God wants for us. That when people see you and the way you treat people, they ought to know that you're a Christian. you saying, Pastor Randy, it's hard this morning because they treated me wrong. In fact, they still owe me some money. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're your enemy unless you want to treat them as an enemy. And that's why we started off with our definition, ekthros, because ekthros is someone who really, really, really is your enemy. They don't want you to progress. Most people we call enemy, we're just mad at them. And if they said that they're sorry, you would forgive them and you would move on. Is this making sense? Oh, I got a long way to go this morning. Let me give you three points. The first one is love begins with the 10. Say love begins with the 10. The Bible says, Mark chapter 12, verse 28. It says, and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? 
And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. I'm glad that we have this in Scripture because when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment, he went all the way back to the Old Testament. Verse 31 says, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Verse 32 says, and the scribe said unto him, well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he and to love him with all thy heart and with all thy understanding and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Turn to your neighbor and say, God don't want your money without your love. So he says, if you don't love, but you still want to come in with burnt offerings and sacrifices, he said, you missed it. I don't know about you, but there was a time in my life when I didn't want to love people and I thought I could give God an extra $10 in the offering. That I was paying penance because I didn't want to do the easier thing, which was to love people and to say I'm sorry. And so and when we have enemies, sometimes we don't want to love our enemies. We'd rather give an extra offering. God says, keep your offering. I want your love. Does this make sense? And so he says at the end of verse 33, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices together. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 22, it says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The commandment of love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do that, you can do anything else God told you to do. That's why he said on these two commandments hang all the law, everything God gave them in the law, and everything the prophets tried to tell them. He said if you can love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself, Genesis all the way to Revelation, you've been, you'll be able to keep it if you love him. Say the 10. And so the Bible says this. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me share this with you. So put up a, so, so we have seen these before because if love begins with the 10, then I just wanted to go over the 10. The first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. Really, we could have a five-part, six-part series on each one of these for six or seven weeks, but I want to run you through them this morning. So, because these are what is commonly referred to the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first one right out the back. Nobody. Mama, sister, brother, father, wife, spouse, husband, you should have nobody in front of God. Then it says, you shall make no idols. So that means that we have no other gods, and then it, we don't make any other gods. We don't make our house our God. We don't make our car our God. We don't make our money our God. We don't, we don't make whatever furniture we have our God. We don't have any other idol in front of God. We don't make our job our God. Right? Where you work so much where you can't honor God. So we have no other idols. Number three, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We've all heard that since we were growing up. Like, we don't use the name of the Lord in vain. Do you know there are, there are some devout Orthodox Jews that they don't even mention the name of God? They don't mention Jehovah. In fact, when they write it out, they leave out the vows because they still feel God's name is so holy. We're still the ones that put OMG in every text message. Be careful. Because honoring God's name and taking the Lord God's name in vain is more than just using the, the G word before your cuss word. Honor his name. Amen. Honor his name, right? Because I grew up old school. You didn't even call your mama by her first name. You certainly didn't call your daddy by his first name. Or she bowed on the porch. Commandment, the next commandment. 
Keep the Sabbath day holy. That was a commandment because God knew that you needed rest. You needed spiritual rest. You needed physical rest. So he said, this is a commandment. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Then he says, honor your father and your mother. And he knows, and if you know anything about Scripture, it says those are the commandments that come with promise. Two things in Scripture regarding parents. First it says, obey. Children, obey your parents. And then it says, honor your parents. So children, you obey because you're in their household. If they tell you to jump, you jump. That's the way it works. As you get older, you're out of their household, you still give them honor. Because at that point, they can tell you to do something and you know it's wrong. You're like, Mama, I'm going to honor you, but... I can't do that. I'm not, I'm not 12 anymore where I had to blindly obey. Then it says, you shall not murder. No drive-bys. No road rage. Y'all don't want to talk to me. We don't murder. And that's just the physical. When I said we could talk more about this, I, I, I could talk about how we murder people with our tongue. But I won't. And then it says, you shall not commit adultery. Adultery. you married, but you're looking at someone else's wife. Looking at someone else's husband. Or you're married and you're looking at a single person. Or a single person, you're talking about the Lord told you that's going to be your husband and they're already married. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, the Lord showed me, Pastor, that, that, that you're going to be divorced and I'm going to be your wife. Girl, stop. Stop. Number eight, you shall not steal. You don't steal. You don't steal from yourself. You don't steal from other people. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Won't bear false witness against your neighbor. You don't get involved with libel. You don't get involved in slandering. You don't get involved in taking bribes to tell a story a certain way. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That your yes should be yes and your no should be no. That you shouldn't be lying on one another, Amen. bearing false witness. So, and you know me. Well, I heard that about this person. No, no, no. You should know me enough to say, oh, no, that ain't, that ain't him. You ought to know one another enough to say, oh, no, that ain't them. That ain't them. That ain't them. Last one is, you shall not covet. The scripture says you shouldn't covet your neighbor's wife. You shouldn't covet your neighbor's husband. You shouldn't covet their manservant. You shouldn't covet their maidservant. You shouldn't covet their chariot. You, you shouldn't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. But this is the thing. You can only covet what you see. Why do we spend some time here? Because when the Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall make no idols, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, that you keep the Sabbath day. Those are things that are affecting you and God. Love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And even in the Ten Commandments, it says, verse number six, it says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shouldn't steal, don't bear false witness, and you shouldn't covet. Those are the things regarding your neighbor. The first four, love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. These are the things that affect you and God. The last six are the things that affect you and your neighbor. Is this making sense? I saw the light bulb come off in some people's eyes. So when God gave the Ten Commandments, four was how you should deal with him. Because some of us do a lot better dealing just with him than we do with other people. If he only gave us four, some of us would think that's better than giving us ten because the last six, I don't like these people. I don't like them. And the Bible says in Mark chapter 12, it says, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And it says, there is none other commandment greater than these. 
We keep going back to love. There's nothing greater than love. That's why love is necessary. That's why love shows that God is our Father and we're striving hard to be like Him. That we love people. Amen. So love begins with tin, but love includes all color of skin. Oh, it's, I'm going to hurt you just a little bit. I'm going to hurt just a little bit because sometimes we don't have problems loving God and people who look like us. That's why I wanted to start with love begins with the 10. That's why. But it just doesn't stop there because love includes all color of skin. I don't like them because they disrespected me. They slandered me. They mistreated me. They marginalized me. And I still have memories of what they did to me. We live in a country where people talked about God, but they didn't show love. I'm just going to get real for half a second this morning and, and just talk about this nation's original sin, for which some people say we shouldn't talk about it and we should just move on. And then some people are saying like, well, it was good because some people learned the skill. Well, don't, don't get me started. I'm in the pulpit. I better leave it alone. And then sometimes when people could have spoke up, they didn't have enough love in their heart to speak up. I want you to know, I feel your pain this morning. Amen. For some people, you still may call an enemy, but I'm telling you, you still have to love them. Amen. Amen. I don't want to underestimate your pain. I don't want to minimize your pain. The beauty of Impact Community Church is that we have a multi-generational church. We have people in this church who have lived through the 60s. We have people in this church who have lived through the 50s. We have people in this church who lived in, through a time where a lot of us, we say we could have done it, but I don't know if we could have done it. I wouldn't have took that. Yeah, you probably would have. If they brought the dogs and the fire hoses out on you, you, you might have. When I was preparing for this sermon, I always remember a lady who came up to me after I had been ordained as a pastor. And I had talked about love in the church, and she was an older lady. And she came up to me and she said, that was a hard lesson today. And I said, yeah, it was, it was difficult. And she said, you know, I lived through the 60s. And she began to tell me some of the things that other cultural people had done to her, Caucasians. And she said, I don't know if I'm going to ever love them. Amen. I'm just being real. And I said, you got to love them. And with tears in her eyes, she was saying, you don't understand because you're not old enough. And with tears in my eyes, I said, I, it hurts me too to see you cry. I may not have known the exact thing that you went through, but I just know what the Bible says. And she was crying because this is the thing. She knew what, the God, what God's word says, but she knew how she was feeling. Does this make sense? She knew that the word said you still have to love your enemies, but it's difficult when you experience prejudice firsthand. Mm -hmm. Can I just share some things? Regarding this country, right? And so, regarding this country. So, back even before many in this room, anyone in this room was born, we had what was known as the Middle Passage from 1517 to 1867, where approximately 12 and a half million Africans were taken from their country 
and shipped over to another country, kidnapped by people who said they were Christians and supposedly had love in their heart. Oh, it's going to get deep in here. When we were then in this country from 1790 to about 1880, there were millions of people in this country that were held as slaves. Just making sense. And then we said, hey, let's emancipate them. So on January, on January 1st, 1863, our president signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Only thing is it didn't get to everybody. They didn't know they were free. So people in Galveston didn't find out they were free until two years later, which is why we celebrate Juneteenth. But Juneteenth actually says you've been out of the loop for two years because nobody wanted to tell you that you were free. Then we passed the 14th Amendment in 1865. What I want you to understand is that you cannot legislate morality. You can't make a law to make people do better. It has to come from love in your heart. If you don't have love in your heart, you can't stay married, you can't, you can't do a lot of things because it has to come from your heart. Like, well, they're doing wrong, so we're going to make a law. Just because you make a law don't mean people are going to do any better than that. And then when people asked about it, the slave traders emphasized obedience to masters, but they de-emphasized deliverance. So they give you a Bible that talked about slaves obey your masters, but then they took out the Moses delivering people part. This country. And after we went from that, we went to what was known as black code and peonage, where we did away with slavery, but if we still caught you doing something that we made a law, that we could still arrest you, and then we could still get free labor from you now through the prison in a work camp. Just making sense. And then we have what was known as Jim Crow. Separate but equal, but not really equal. And then we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then we have unprecedented incarceration, where this country incarcerates more people than all the other countries in the world. And then we already know that our kids go to the principal's office more than all the other kids. But we all grab our little Bibles and we go to church on Sunday and say we love one another. This is what hurts my heart. We all say, hey, I love you, you love me, Today we experience aggression and, and what they call microaggressions. You deal with Karens and Kevins. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, where is the love? Where, where is the love? Some people don't want to talk about this. I don't talk about it every Sunday, but I just think that today, I mean, my goal is to inform and educate because I want to give you a backdrop of how bright your light could be if you decided to love. So all the way from the 1600s to where we are today, you want people to love. In the middle of slavery, do you know that the King James Version of the Bible was codified in 1611? So they had the Bible. They had the scriptures on love. You got the scriptures on love. So it's just not them. Uh-oh. See, so if you're here this morning and you've experienced Jim Crow and lived through the Civil Rights Act, it might be difficult. If you're here this morning and you've lived through Jim Crow Civil Rights Act, lift your hand in here. 
It was real, wasn't it? It was, it was, it was real. I remember my father giving, telling me stories about, man, and my father's a pastor. He's like, well, you can't trust everybody. When he was going to school at UCO back in the day, I guess it was Central State, he was driving home after going to school and one of his car wheels just rolled off because somebody had loosened the love nut. That was back in the day. Is this making sense? It got quiet in here. It should have been. Because the Bible says this in John chapter 13, verse 34. It says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. So all of this has happened in history. Some of it didn't even happen to you personally. And you're using that as a reason not to love today. It didn't happen to you. And now you're calling someone your enemy. And you're saying you can't love them. Because what happened in history? Oh, you know I was going to have to come this way. You know I was going to have to come this way. And I don't like this race, and I don't like that person, and I don't like this, and I don't like what they stand for. And I'm like, who did the anything to you? Uh-oh. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 24. I've got about 12 scriptures. I'm going to go through them pretty fast, but I want to get to verse 12. Matthew chapter 24 is Jesus talking to his disciples, just telling them about things to come. And it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. What shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and, and shall deceive many. Remember, they asked him, tell us some things that are getting ready to happen. What are the signs that, that you're going to go and you're going to come back? Verse 6, it says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Wars and rumors of wars. Verse 7 says, nation shall rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places like Oklahoma. And you have Ukraine and Russia, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And, and you have uh, Israel versus Palestine. And, 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 and you have China and South Korea. And, and any day it could pop off. And we still just walking like, you know, I'm going to the party. Girl, you going to the party? I'm going to the party. And all of this is going on all around us. And these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. He's telling them what's going to happen to them. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Wax coal in the Greek comes from the word suko, and it means to breathe, blow, to make cool. I grow cold to refresh with cold air. So in the midst of people that should be hot, on fire for God, that's how some people's love is. It's, it's going cold. Last week we talked about marriages, and sometimes when you've had enough, you stop Fan in the flame, you'd just rather blow it out. Amen. 
The Bible says near the end of the last days, people won't love one another. In fact, when they're in the capacity to love, they would rather just blow cold air on it. Because now I'm only in it for me. And so you can see people's light is flickering and flickering and flickering, just like a birthday candle. And I see this person needs help, but I don't have the love that I need, so... And I see this marriage needs help, but I don't have the love that I need. In fact, I actually want their spouse, so I'll make sure that... I know they need a car. I could probably get them a used car, but I really want to get a car for myself. So I'm <sighs> every day I go to the store, I see the same person on the sign, on the corner with the sign. Because <sighs> I can't think about you. Because I'm only thinking about me. But I say that I love people. Where is the love? So on the world stage, we have famines and massacres and earthquakes. On the home front, we argue and cancel each other. We believe that insurrection is the answer. We argue about climate change. We argue about over decisions. We, we argue about decisions to wear a mask or not wear a mask. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask and you can not wear a mask, then don't wear a mask. This is making sense. We argue over to get vaccinated or not to be vaccinated. We argue over everything and then we make people our enemy because now I, can't, I don't want to hear anything you got to say. You're my enemy because I wanted to wear a mask and you didn't want to wear a mask. Are we serious? Everyone has their own agenda. And we become tribal in nature. It's my tribe. And if you're not for me, then I'm not for you. And, and how we vote. I, I vote just based on, on, on one thing. If they say they're going to forgive my student loan, he got my vote. Or if he says he's going to give me a tax cut, he got my vote. I don't care what else they said about anything else, anybody else. If you give me a tax cut, I'm voting. Y'all don't want to talk to me. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, it says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself. It can't stand. It can't stand. A family divided against itself can't stand. A marriage divided against itself can't stand. A church divided against itself can't stand. A country divided against itself can't stand. A nation divided against itself can't stand. And instead of fanning the heat of God, we continue to blow cold air on every situation to the point that I don't even want to try and understand what you're saying. In fact, I'm going to turn it to the news station that I like because I never ever have to hear anything else other than what I like to hear. Whether it's CNBC, whether it's MSB, whatever it is. It wasn't like in the old days, everybody had to watch Walter Cronkite. <laughs> now I get to listen to what I want to listen to only. Just make a sense. You're like, I didn't come to church to hear our lap. Yes, you did. Amen. Love begins with the 10. Love includes all color of skin. Love requires us to love again and again. 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 Because people aren't perfect. Newsflash, you're not perfect. 
And someone's going to have to continue to love again and again and again and again. Because that's what love does. The Bible says in John chapter 21, I love this. We'll read this. I got a couple more comments and we'll be done. It says, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my lambs. He said to him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my sheep. Verse 17, it says, he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time. Peter got mad because Jesus asked him the same question three times. Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Verse 15 says this. This is what I need you to understand. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of Jonas, agape, agape, thou me more than these. He said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I phileo thee more than these. You should have pulled out your, your little bookmark by now. Agape means unconditional love. So Jesus is asking him, do you have unconditional love for me more than anybody else in this room? Do you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, more so than all these other disciples, more than anybody else in your life? Do you love me more than that? I've got a newsflash for you. You are not here just for you. You are here to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's why you should be loving one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. So when they had dined, Jesus said to him, Simon, do you agape, agape thou me more than these? And he said, yeah, Lord, you know I phileo you. He said unto him, feed my lambs. So he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you agape, agape me? And he said, yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I phileo you. And he said to him, feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, phileo thou me. And that's when Peter got grieved because Jesus was trying to pull Peter's love up to agape. Peter, who had just denied Jesus three times in front of everybody, that's why Jesus said, do you love me more than all these people? Because you're the one who said, oh, no, all these other people are going to deny you, but I ain't going to deny you. So, so for, he denied Jesus three times, and for each denial, Jesus asked him, do you love me? Because for every denial, he's trying to cover it with love. Because none of us are perfect. So that means you're going to have to love again and again and again. And sometimes it'll hurt your feelings because Jesus might be trying to pull you up to a higher level of love, but you want to stay at a lower level of love. Is this making sense? Impact. Do you agape Jesus? Or do you just phileo Jesus? Like we're friends, but he's not my God. And notice this. Verse 15, he says, if you love me, he said, then feed my lambs. Say lambs. Amen. Verse 16, the Bible says at the end, it says, feed my sheep. And then verse 17, he says, feed my sheep. God has you here for work. The love that you have for people will help them as they develop from lambs to sheep to older sheep. Does this make a sense? Because he said, this is, that, and that's why you need agape love. Because as people transition, you're going to transition, right? And so we're the ones that go from lamb to sheep to sheep. 
And we pray that people will continue to love us again and again and again and again and again. Because we're bound to make mistakes. Is this making sense? The church has been called to love. The one gift that everyone needs in the earth is love. Everyone that Jesus met needed love. When Jesus met Matthew, the tax collector, he needed love. When Jesus met the lady at the well, who everyone else ostracized, she needed love. When Jesus met Zacchaeus on the edge of the tree limb, he needed love. The people around you, they need what the world needs. It's more than a song. And if the church does not have love, then where will the world have love? We have allowed the world to affect the church instead of the church infecting the world. If there is ever a group of people who should love one another and prefer one another, it's the church. It's the church. It's the church. It's the church. I'll leave you with this story. It's been over 20 years or so ago now, but I remember when we moved to the community that we live in now, and my kids were uh, in school. I remember my daughter was in elementary school. She was in elementary school at the time. We had just moved into our neighborhood. It was July, August, we had moved in. We sent the kids to school, and within the first two weeks, of my daughter Jasmine going to school, she came home crying because she said nobody on the playground wanted to play with her. They told her that she was brown and that her hair was different. I never thought I would have to have a conversation with a six-year-old six about race. Amen. And then when I took a step back, I thought, why would these other six-year-olds what are they listening to or who are they listening to in order to talk to my daughter about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, what's acceptable skin color, what's, skeptical, what, what's acceptable hair? And I thought, wow, is this making sense? We also had our son in the same community in a, it was like a private home daycare with a lot of other kids, because the lady just had daycare, and um, she had a, like a meet and greet with all of the parents. So, so the kids had went there for probably two or three weeks, four weeks, and then she had a meet and greet at her house. And when we went there, I'm, I'm having fun, I'm laughing, and Tarsh, when we got in the car, Tarsh was like, did you see? Because they were looking at us kind of differently. I'm like, girls, don't worry about it. Within a week, because we were, we were looking, some of the other parents were kind of looking at us, and you know, I'm like, my kid, go here too. Within a week, she called us, and she said, Mr. House, um, uh, Caleb is just he's, just, he's just, he's just all over the place, and he's this, that, and the other, and we're not just, we're not going to be able to keep him here. A week after meeting all the other parents, and I said this, because I'm a typical parent. I told Tarsha, hey, anything, hey, look, anything that you need from him, Caleb got a good daddy. I will make sure it happens, right? Because we need this daycare because it fits within our, 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 our hours, our work. Please, what, what can we do? She, she, she wasn't hearing any of it. She's like, he, he's got to go. Because he was just so rambunctious and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, well, who was he with? Well, that doesn't, that doesn't matter who he's with. It's just like you need, he's not going to be able to stay here anymore. I thought, 
wow, that, that was my introduction to the community. And I thought, wow, is this making sense? So I said, Lord, why do you even have me in Oklahoma? I can go to Atlanta, I, I can go to Houston, I can go around people who look like me, people that will appreciate me. And he said, don't you know racism is a spirit? And he said, I have you in Oklahoma for a reason. And I'm like, can you just make sure? Can you just, can you just, can you just make sure? Because we could go right down I-35. But just because people are your same skin don't mean that they are kin. It, it might not just, you know, the people who hurt you most may not be white people. May not be Latinos. And he said there's some things you just can't run from because you're trying to get around people who look like you. Because people who look like you can be treacherous too. So through the tears and the hurt, because I was hurt, you can mess with me, but don't mess with my kids. Don't mess with my kids. And I thought, wow, so this is all of the stuff my daddy was telling me. And that was history. But this is the thing, I didn't want to love people because of the history because there was something now that was in me. And it's sad sometimes when history becomes an enemy, but then the enemy is within me. Because it's not something that they did. Some of us are mad at history, and that becomes your enemy. And the real enemy I'm going to leave you with this video. This is one of the greatest displays of love I had ever seen at the time, and it always, it always stuck with me. Just, just to kind of set it up, this young man's older brother was shot in the Dallas area by a police officer who thought that she had went to her apartment and it was actually his apartment and she shot him thinking that he was intruding in her apartment. And so he takes the stand to give just a statement to the judge and a, a statement to um, uh, the police officer who shot his brother and this is, this is what he says. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just, I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the things, the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And. I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but 
I see. I I personally want the best for you. And I I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. That's, I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. Sometimes loving people is not easy. You can turn the lights back on. Because everyone will try to tell you what you should do and how you should handle this and you should be revengeful and, and he's making a victim's witness statement. And you could tell because he's like pulling at his, I mean, sometimes to do the right thing, man, is, is, is stressful. But to live the way God has called us to live means that sometimes you may be at odds with everybody else who think you should do it the one way that everybody else is doing it. So he leaves the courtroom, everybody's outside still shouting what you should do and this, that, and the other. But sometimes you just gotta be a man and woman and do what God has called you to do. Yeah, go ahead and clap for that. To love the unlovable and to love people that have done you wrong, that's the greatest display of Christianity that you can have. We'll stand on our feet. Who is it that God is trying to get you to love right now? Usually in times like this, when, when the preacher asks the question, that person's picture comes right into your mind. So you don't even have to pretend like, Lord, who is it? Who, who, is it that, who is it that God is saying, you need to do better? They're not the enemy. The lady at the daycare, she wasn't the enemy. The two kids on the playground, they weren't the enemy. But they still required love. How much love will you give? Will you be like Peter and say, hey, I'll give phileo, but I don't know if I'm going to give agape. Lift your hands where you are. Strong churches have strong people who do what God has called them to do regardless of all of the naysayers. They love even though people telling them you shouldn't love them and they're asking them, how can you continue to love them? Love is not a feeling. It's a decision. The reason we're still married today is because love was a decision. It wasn't a feeling. Love for you will be a decision. When he took the stand, love was a decision, not what he felt. His brother had just been married, uh, just been murdered in his own apartment. But he said, I still wish the best for you. The best thing you can do is to give your life to Christ. 
If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you want to experience the love that I've been preaching about for the past four weeks, just lift your hand in here. I want to lead you in a simple prayer this morning. Because if you don't know him, you need to know him before you leave here today. You need to experience an unconditional love from a loving father who loves you. If you're here this morning and you don't know him, just lift your hands in here. I want to lead you in a prayer. I see some hands. Amen. So repeat after me, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come as a sinner in need of a Savior. Father, forgive me of all of my sins. Separate my sin as far as the east is from the west. Father, I repent of all of my sins, and I ask you to forgive me. I confess the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And because of my repentance, my belief, and my confession, I know I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God praise in here. Turn to your neighbor and say, being a Christian, may not be easy all the time. May not be easy all the time. But you can do it. You can do it. Hey, we want to thank you for watching our broadcast today. We hope that something was said that would give you encouragement, something that would help you strengthen your walk with Jesus Christ. Our goal is to cover the entire earth with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If this message has been a blessing to you, just let us know. Leave us a comment in the line. Give us a thumbs up. And so until the next time, God bless you.